Thank you. you. May be seated. I'd like you to take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn with me once again to John 15. This morning we looked at the first eight verses. Tonight we're going to uh, look at the next section of that. We're going to begin in verse 8 where we ended. We're going to read down through verse 17. The message, we're going to look at some other aspects uh, in the latter part of the chapter. But uh, we're going to read uh, verses 8 through 17. The Bible says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. We're called to be disciples. The word disciple means a learner. Uh, or a follower. We're called to be followers of Christ, to be learners of Christ, uh, to, I don't see what you're talking about. Oh, I'm just going to stick right here, okay? It's too late for that. Um, so uh, we need to be disciples. We need to be learners. We need to be followers of Christ. And, um, and we to, we're to bring glory to God. That's why we're here, to bring glory to God. And uh, part, of, uh, part of bringing glory to God is bearing fruit. Part of bring, being glory to, bringing glory to God and bearing fruit is being his disciple. He goes on in verse 9, he says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You know, Jesus obeyed the Father, and he set an example for us to follow in obeying the Father. And we need to do the will of the Father just like Jesus did the will of the Father. I don't know about you, but I'm really glad Jesus did the will of the Father. Amen? I'm glad he finished his purpose for being here. And we each have a purpose for being here and, uh, and to bring glory to the Father and to be used by him to reach this world with the gospel. And we need to do our part in our purpose in being here. We need to be obedient to the Father. He goes on in verse 11, he says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. See, the key is joy, and not just a little bit of joy, but full joy. And it's not our joy that we can work up on our own. It's his joy in us. See, this morning we talked about that. It's not us that produces fruit. It's he that produces fruit in us as we walk with him, as we listen to him, as we grow closer to him, as his love flows through us, as we are rooted in his word, as we are yielded to him. He produces the fruit. And here we're talking about joy. And a lot of people, they need joy. They need hope. They need peace. My friend, the, the, the peace and the joy and the hope that anybody needs is a peace and a joy and a hope that only the Lord can can provide and and we've got to get it from him and we've got to let him do it in us it's not something we can do on our own it's his joy and he wants it to be full in our lives and walking with him being obedient to him experiencing his love that helps us to experience his his joy in full measure he goes on in verse 12 and he says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. See, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, I have loved you. And here he says, As I have loved you, I, you are to love one another. My friend, we cannot love people right until we've experienced his love in our lives. Amen. And we need to let his love flow through us to others if we're going to truly love them right. Jesus said... That we're to love others as he loved us. How did Jesus love us? With a sacrificial love. We talked about that this morning. He left heaven and came to earth in human form. That's where his sacrifice began. He, laid, he, he loved us by laying down his life. And, and being willing to take that on. We need to lay down our desires. Lay down our wants. Lay down sometimes even our rights. For the sake of others. And honoring them. And loving them. And blessing them. See, Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? Well, he spent time with us. He walked with the disciples, right? He loved them by telling them whatever the Father gave him to, tell, to speak, he spoke to them. My friend, one of the most loving things we can do is share with others what we've experienced with the Lord. See, he says, love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Obviously, Jesus did that physically. And maybe someday we might be called upon to do that physically. 
but we need to do that uh, in a practical way on a regular basis. Honoring others above ourselves. The Bible talks about that. We need to show that kind of love. Lay down ourselves for others. He says, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I commanded you. Obedience is part of this relationship with the Lord. And we looked at this this morning. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, because for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. See, it's about knowing. It's about knowing his word. It's about knowing his truth. It's about knowing his purpose. Knowing him on an intimate level. And he says in verse 16, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. My friend, that's the mission. Go and bring forth fruit. See, we do the going. We do the sow, seed sowing. We do the sharing. We do the speaking. He's the one that bears the fruit, right? We do our part. He does his part. We can't do his part. And he, he, he tells us to do our part. He says that your fruit should remain. The fruit that he produces in us remains to the glory of God. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you that you love one another. See, it begins with loving one another. It ends with loving one another. See, we have the mission of Christ defined for us. See, this morning we looked at how to be rooted in his mission. And the reality is, we'll never be rooted in his mission if we're not rooted in him, we're not rooted in his love, and we're not rooted in his word. And if we will root ourselves in him by faith in him and salvation, and we root ourselves in his love by intimate relationship with him and growing closer to him, and we root ourselves in his word by being in it, by reading it, by putting it into our hearts and minds and meditating on it, my friend, he will root us in his mission. So the, na the question is, what's his mission? According to this text, his mission is very clearly defined. The first point of his mission is that we would extol God in all that we do. That we would praise him, that we would bring him glory, that we would lift him up, that we would magnify him. See, those words speak to this word extol, and, and every one of those words are in the scripture. To praise him, to magnify him, to lift him up, to, to glorify him. That is why we are here. You, you people wonder, why am I here? I'm telling you, this is why you're here. If you are saved and you are here, you are here to praise God, to bring him glory. That's why we're here. Why do we meet as a church? To praise God and bring him glory. That's why we are here. That's why we're here in this building. That's why we're, tomorrow when you go to work, you're not just going there to clock in and to earn a paycheck. You're there to bring glory to God. Amen. See, that's why we're here. That's our purpose. That's Christ's mission, to bring glory to the Father. Did Jesus bring glory to the Father? Yes, he did. Did he lead the way for us to bring glory to the, God, to the Father? Yes, he did. Did he leave us an example that we should follow in his steps and bring glory to the Father? Yes, he did. See, the mission of Christ, if we're going to be rooted in his mission, we must be glorifying the Father. Amen. Jesus said here in this passage, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. See, my friend, we bring glory to the Father by bearing much fruit. Again, like I said this morning, the branch does not produce the fruit. The tree produces the fruit. Amen. The branch holds the fruit. The ba branch bears the fruit. That means holds it. The branch displays the fruit. Amen? I don't, if I want fruit off of my fruit tree, I don't go to the trunk of the tree. Right? You're never going to find fruit on the trunk of a tree. You go to the branches coming off of the trunk of the tree, right? Amen. That's where the fruit is. My friend, the fruit comes on the branch. We see it. See, the fruit is seen on the branch, but it comes from the tree. People ought to see God's glory being shown in our lives. But it's not just out of us. It's out of his work in us. He's producing the fruit as we're yielding to him. 
And you know, fruit is not on unhealthy branches. Fruit's on healthy branches. You know the best thing to do with unhealthy branches? If you, you might want to try to doctor them up if you want to. I had this one tree and, and it was just pathetic. It always had been pathetic. And I told my neighbor that I was going to yank it up. And he said, oh, you ought to, you ought to, you know, put some fertilizer on that thing. And I said, uh-uh. I put a chain around the base of that and I yanked it up because it had been sorry the whole time I had it. It had always been feeble and weak and, and just pathetic and never did produce anything. See, when you got a when you got an unhealthy branch, you need to get rid of that because it can make the rest of the tree unhealthy, right? right. See, healthy branches have healthy help of the have, have, are healthy because of the tree and they produce healthy fruit. My friend, we bring glory to God by bearing much fruit. And we bring glory to God in bearing much of his fruit in us. He, it's his fruit. He produces it. It's his fruit in us from him. It's his fruit in us about him. It's his fruit in us that glorifies him. And it's his fruit in us that blesses him and blesses others. You know, when God sees his children and they're being fruitful, he's blessed by that. Amen? They're doing their job. They're doing their purpose. They're accomplishing the goal. He's blessed by that. And you know, he's not the only one blessed by that. Others are blessed by that. When a Christian acts like a Christian, other Christians are blessed by that. When a Christian acts like a Christian, the lost should be blessed by that too because they're seeing Christ in living color. See, we bless him and we bless others when we are bearing his fruit that he produces in us as we yield to him. See, we bring glory to God in bearing much fruit that only he can produce. It's not stuff we can do on our own. See, some people had the idea, well, yeah, I need God, but I can do it on my own. No, you can't do this on your own. This fruit that the God is talking about, you cannot produce on your own. This fruit is holy fruit. You, don't, you can't produce holy fruit on your own. The only holy fruit that can come out of you is from his holiness in you. And if his holiness is in, not in you, it's not going to come from you. Amen? See, it's his fruit. He produces it. He brings himself glory through us as we yield to him. See, it's his spiritual life flowing through us. And this is something that only God can produce. Spiritual life is only something God can produce in us. You know, you don't save you. You don't save you. And you don't save anybody else. How did you get saved? Well, first of all, admit you needed it. Well, who told you you needed it? God did. If God hadn't told you, guess what? You would think you're pretty good all by yourself. But God told you you weren't. God told you you were a sinner. Right? Amen. Anybody got saved, that's how they got saved. Well, if you, if you realize you're a sinner, you realize you got a problem. And then if you realize you got this problem you can't fix, you got a bigger problem. Amen? Amen? A problem you can fix is really not big of, that big of a problem if you can fix it, right? It's just a minor inconvenience until you get it fixed. But a, a problem you can't fix, now that's a problem. See, spiritual life is not something you can produce. It's something he has to produce in you. And it's not, some, it's not only can you not produce it in you, you cannot produce it in somebody else. He has to do that. See, guess what? Just like you can't produce spiritual life, you cannot produce spiritual growth. You cannot mature you spiritually. Oh, yes, I can, Pastor. I can read the Bible so many hours a day. I can memorize so many scriptures a week. I can be at church so many times. I can do this, I can do that, I can do the other. Well, yeah, you can do all that. But all that's not going to mature you spiritually. Oh boy, come on, good preach. Doing all that puts you in a place where God can mature you spiritually if you're really doing it for him. But if you're doing it just for a checklist, if you're doing it just to be seen of men, you know what you're producing in you? A nice Pharisee. 
The world has enough Pharisees to look at. They don't need any more. You cannot produce spiritual life in you. You cannot produce spiritual maturity in you. I can't produce spiritual maturity in you. I can study the word. I can prepare sermons that have some milk for some baby Christians and some meat for some older Christians. And I can listen to the Holy Spirit guide me as I prepare that message. But I cannot produce spiritual growth in anybody's life, not even my own. But I can sow the seed. I can water the seed with the word. I can pray over the seed, but God has to give the increase, amen? See, spiritual life is something only God can produce. Spiritual growth is something only God can produce. Spiritual maturity is something only God can produce. And guess what? Spiritual reproduction is something only God can produce. Amen. Just like you can't save you, you can't save anybody else. Just kind of like you can't mature you, you can't mature anybody else. Now you can do the things that put you in a place where that is, that God can do that in you. But you can't do it in you. See, it's his, it, he has to produce it in us and in others. See, in bearing much fruit is, is about being his disciples. And that's what Jesus says, you're my disciples if you obey me, you are my disciples. If you bear much fruit, it's all about being a disciple. And, and as I mentioned before, a, a disciple is one that is following Christ. Amen. And he's, he's working in us. As we follow him, he's working in us. As we walk with him, he's working in us. See, we don't mature us, but as we walk with him, he matures us. As we spend time with him, as we follow him, he guides us into maturity. As we listen to him, he works in us and he speaks to us about things he doesn't want in our lives. And he speaks to us about things he does want in our lives. And as we yield to those things, he's maturing us. See, he does the work in us as we walk with him, as we listen to him, as we follow him. And as we know him more, he works in us. As we spend time in his word, getting to know him more, he's working his word in us to grow us and mature us. He's doing the work. We're just getting to know him more in his word. And my friend, as we obey him, he's working in us to produce in us a disciple. See, if we just stay where we are and we don't, we don't get into the word and we don't walk with him and we don't follow him and we don't learn of him and we don't obey him, guess what we're going to do? We're going to stay exactly where we are, the way we are. A baby Christian, that's it. But again, we don't make us grow. We follow him. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, right? Amen. Come unto me and you will become fishers of men. See, we follow him. He does the work in us as a disciple. See, in bearing much fruit... By being his disciple together with other disciples. See, God is glorified as we are gathered together with other disciples, following him together, learning of him together, getting to know him more together, encouraging one another together. See, Jesus is talking to the 11 disciples, or the 12 disciples. Judas was still there at this time. They're together. And he's teaching them together. My friend, as I've said before, I'll say it again. There are things that God wants to do in your life. He's only going to do when we're together. And there is other things that God wants to do in your life. He's only going to do when it's just you and him in your prayer closet somewhere. My friend, we, we need to be together. But we need to be with God alone too. God's plan is both. And here the disciples are together. And Jesus is to te teaching them about being disciples together. 
They see as we pray for one another, he blesses us together. As we serve one another, he blesses us together. As we serve with each other, he blesses us together. And as we love one another, as he said several different times in this passage, as we love one another, he blesses us together. The disciples were together when he gave this teaching. We gather together so we can grow together and bring glory to God together as his disciples. So his, his mission is about bringing glory to God. Another aspect of his mission is about enjoy, enjoying abiding in his love. Notice verse 9, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. He wants us not only to experience his love, he wants us to continue. He wants us to be rooted in his love. He said, if you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. It's about being in, re in connection with him, in intimacy with him, in fellowship with him. And that's all about obedience to him. He says, even as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. See, my friend, it's about enjoying being the object of his love. God wants us to be the object of his love. My friend, that's a great truth. Amen? Being the focus of his love. Being the object of his affection. Being loved by God. Can you just ponder that thought just a little bit being loved by God I mean how undeserving are we of that yet in Christ we can have that and we can enjoy it fully not just a little bit fully as we walk with him as we obey him as we get to know him more we enjoy we experience his love more and more fully and that's what God, Jesus, wants for us. That is Christ's mission, that we would bring glory to God and that we would enjoy his love in our lives. This is what he wants for his followers, his disciples, to enjoy his love, to enjoy being loved by him, being the object of his love, having God's love in your life through Christ and having God's love flow through your life unto others my friend that is that's what the fruit is all about his love flowing through you to others that's what's going to bless them and that's what's going to glorify the father it's about enjoying being the benefactor of his love being the the being the one that benefits from his love my friend just think about benefiting from god's love just 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 think about this thought okay belonging to him that's an amazing thought. Now I belong to Jesus. Amen. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. Amen. Precious blood of Christ. I belong to him. The idea of a sense of belonging. That, that is why the, the, our young adults are, are, are many, too many of them are, are just getting engaged in all of this chaos and confusion and distraction because they've got a purpose. My friend, God has a far greater purpose for you. Amen. Well, I fit into that. God wants you to fit in with him and that's far better. Amen. Well, I, I feel like I have a connection with them. Well, God wants you to have a connection with him. That's even far better. Amen. You know how gangs, you know how gangs get people to willingly go through a beat down to get into their gang? So they have a place to belong. They exploit the need to belong to something. You know how Satan gets somebody to, to let others use and abuse them? Because they feel like they belong to something. My friend, God wants you to feel like you belong to, to him. <laughs> the benefactor of his love. To be recipient of his love. See, verse 10 talks about that. He says, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. My friend, benefiting from God's love is an amazing thing. Being the object of his love is an amazing thing. Belonging to him is an amazing thing. 
My friend, if that doesn't fill your joy, I don't know what will. The creator of the universe wants you to be part of his family. Amen. And wants to use you to help other people be part of his family. My friend, if that doesn't give you a sense of belonging, I don't know what will. That's something far greater than just yourself. See, he wants us to enjoy being the object of his love. He wants us to enjoy being the benefactor of his love. And he wants us to enjoy being the recipient of his love. These things have I spoken unto you. How, how, how is it that our joy can remain and our joy can be full and his joy be in us? As we let him speak to us. We let him speak to us through his word. We let him speak to us in his worship. We let him speak to us through his spirit. As, we, as he speaks to us and we're obedient to his speaking, my friend, we have joy and God is glorified. We experience his love in a greater way and God is glorified. So our mission is first of all to bring glory to God, to extol, extol God in all that we do. His mission, Christ's mission is for us to enjoy abiding in his love and his joy might be in us and our joy might be full as the object of his love and the benefactor of his love and the recipient of his love. But thirdly, I want you to see that it's about expressing his love to others. See, this is his mission, that we would express his love to others. He says in verse 12, that you love one another. He says in verse 17, that you love one another. He says in verse 13, that you lay down your life in, 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 in showing this love to one another. He says in verse 15, that you're my friends because I've told you what the Father's given me. I've shared with you his love. And he tells us in verse 16 that we've been chosen or ordained to let his love flow through us to other people to bear much fruit. See, it's about expressing his love to others. Who are the others? Well, first of all, who's in that group of people? When he says love one another, the disciples. He wants us to love other, other believers. Jesus also said... In, in John 13, we're right there in John 15. Turn back to John 13 in verse 34. I want you to see this. Jesus said this. is This is still in the upper room discourse. Same night, same time frame, same teaching. Jesus said this. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. Same thing he says in, verse, uh, in chapter 15. And then he goes on to say this. As I have loved you. Same thing that he said in chapter 15. That ye also love one another. Notice verse 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. See Jesus said that the identifying mark as a true follower of Jesus is loving other true followers of Jesus. Loving one another. That's what Jesus said. How can we love God whom we have not seen and hate our brother whom we have seen? John says that in the epistle of 1 John. See, Jesus said this is how others can see that we are true followers of Jesus as we love one another who are also true followers of Jesus. You know, when a church splits over the color of the carpet, that is not showing the world the love of Jesus. And that is pathetic. When somebody in, in, a, in the same church has something against somebody else in that church and they don't talk to each other for weeks and months and years and, and, and the lost know about that, my friend, that is not showing the loss that we love one another. And the sad reality is when husbands and wives can't get along and they say that they both belong to Jesus, we're not being a good evidence to the world of loving one another. See, Jesus said, if you truly follow me, you will love one another. This is the evidence of being a follower of Christ. This is the evidence of being a true disciple of Christ. Learning of him. Learning how to love. And when we truly are following Jesus, we'll love not only like Jesus, we'll love what Jesus loves. 
You know what Jesus loves? The Father. You can't love the Father without loving the Son. You know what else Jesus loves? Being obedient to the Father. He said that. He was obedient to the Father. He abided in the Father's love. So if we are following Jesus, it'll help us to be obedient to the Father and, and experience it and love the Father. See, when we are truly following Jesus, we're going to love the brethren and we're going to be patient with them because we're going to want them to be patient with us, right? Why, 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 why is that? Because Jesus loves the brethren. He gave himself for them, right? So if we're following him, we're going to love the brethren. And guess what else? If we're truly following Jesus, we're going to love the lost. Because Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen? See, it's about loving others. It's about loving others over ourselves. Look at verse 13. He says this, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It's about loving others over ourselves. We have no problem loving ourselves. And Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, right? And talking about to the husband about the wife, he says, if a man, no man ever hated himself, he nourisheth and cherisheth himself. And he ought to do that with his wife, right? See, we're to love others over ourselves. We're to lay down ourselves for others. Making their needs greater than our wants. Making their soul worth more than, than uh, your comfort and your pleasure. A lot of people, they won't, they won't go out and do, knock on doors and pass out tracks because it doesn't fit in their schedule. Well, we need to value the souls of others over our schedule. Amen. It's about making their eternity more important than just our own. See, some people have the idea, well, I'm going to heaven. That's all that matters. Well, that's pretty selfish, isn't it? Yeah. It's not just about you going to heaven. It's about you helping other people go to heaven because you are going to heaven. Amen? Right. See, we're to love others over ourselves. John 13, verse 13 makes that clear. And we're to love our Savior as our friend. As we listen to him and we grow closer to him and we, we hear his heart, it helps us to love him as a friend. Loving the Savior as the true God. I think it's in your note, 1 John 5.20. Is that in your notes? That passage says this. We know that the... Let's turn there. You're in John 15. Go back to the back to 1 John, the epistle of John. 1 John chapter... 5 and verse 20 it says and we know that the son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in his son Jesus Christ this is the true God and eternal life Amen. my friend there's a lot of religions out there that don't believe Jesus is God. That's right. My Bible says Jesus is the true God. Amen. There's a lot of people trusting their religion that doesn't believe in Jesus as God to get them to heaven. And they're not going to get to heaven because they're not trusting Jesus to be the true God. See, he's, we need to love the true God, our Jesus as our Savior and our friend. Loving the true God that's manifested in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's a lot of religions don't believe in the triune Godhead. But the Bible's very clear about that. Amen. Right. See, if you love the Son, then you're going to love the Father. And if you love the Father, you're going to love the Son. And if you love the Father and the Son, you're going to love the Spirit. It's not about one uh, being more significant than the other. My friend, we are to love God with all Amen. our heart. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It's about loving others and taking his love to them. See, this is, the, this is what the Great Commission is all about. Taking his love to others. Thou shalt, that's when Jesus was asked, what's the great commandment? 
In Matthew 22, he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. See, my friend, the, the, taking God's love to others is, is the, the encompassing of the great commission. And it encompasses all of the commandments. My friend, this is... Christ's mission to be the benefactor of his love and to express his love with, to others so they can be the benefactor of his love. To enjoy being loved by him and helping others enjoy being loved by him. And while we're doing that, bringing glory to him in all that we do. This is his mission. This is Christ's mission that we are to be rooted in. Jesus said, this is the great commandment. To love God with your all Amen. and to love others as yourself. And here's another part of Christ's mission. So that we can experience his spirit's comfort. And the rest of the chapter is dealing with that. And it's talking about when the world hates you. You know what you need when the world hates you? To experience Christ, the Spirit's comfort. You know why the world hates you? Because it hates Jesus. Oh, yeah, that's right. And it hated Jesus before it hated you, right? That's right. And it hates you just for doing right. There's, there's people out there right now that just hate you if you do the right thing. They want you to do the wrong thing. So they don't feel bad about doing the wrong thing. And if you do the right thing, they're going to hate you for it. This whole cancel culture is all about hating people for doing the right thing because they don't like the right thing. They want you to do their thing. Guess what? You need to do God's thing and don't worry about their thing. Amen. Sometimes you're a witness to somebody and they hate you for it. But God wants us to be a faithful witness. But the Holy Spirit living in us can comfort us when we're experiencing that hatred. My friend, Jesus suffered. If we're going to be like Jesus, we can expect some suffering, right? Jesus was comforted when he suffered. After he fasted 40 days and was tempted in the wilderness by the devil, an angel came and ministered to him, right? He was comforted in his suffering. When they hate you, only because you love Jesus, Jesus was hated because he loved the Father. When they hate your goodness that causes them to realize their wickedness, Jesus suffered that way. People hated him because he was righteous and it convicted them about their wickedness. When you don't feel like you fit in this world, and my friend, as the world gets darker, a child of God living for God is gonna feel less and less like they fit into this world. And we need to find comfort in the Spirit. We need to experience His comfort, His ministry to us. When they despise us just for who we are in Christ, we need to experience the Spirit's comfort in us. You know, there's people that are in prison right now in China under Qing, the emperor of the Communist Party of China. You know why they're in prison? Because they're religious. Some of them are Muslims, and they're in prison. But some of them are true believers in Jesus Christ. And they're in prison. You know the worst province of China for prison concentration camps for religious people? The province where that movie, what is that movie? Terry, help me out here, Mulan? where Mulan was filmed. There's the most concentration camps in that province of China. Natural beauty, yes. Spiritual darkness, far more. My friend, there are people suffering just because they love Jesus. And when we think we've got it bad, we need to pray for those who are really suffering, that they would experience the comfort of of Jesus 
I personally have not watched any professional athletics since they have bowed the knee to China for the almighty dollar. It is pathetic. There are people just like you and me who believe just like you and me who are in prison just because they believe in Jesus in China. And when you're sharing what you've experienced with others and they don't want to hear, you need the comfort of the Holy Spirit in you. Amen. When you are sharing and you're doing and you're sowing and you're watering and, and you're not seeing the increase, you just need to trust the Lord for that. That's his part. Amen. Amen. Just be obedient. When it doesn't seem like anyone's listening. <laughs> Sometimes pastors wonder about that. <laughs> Is anybody listening? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> we just need to trust the Lord because that's his part. Amen. When we're not seeing results, we just need to trust the Lord. Because that's his part. We need to do our part. And let him do his part. This is his mission. And we need to be part of it. We need to be rooted in it. And when we are, God is glorified. And lives are touched. And we're fulfilling his mission for us. Let's do that. Let's pray.